folks, welcome back to Indaba Africa. This is Chris once again. Hey folks, welcome back to Indaba Africa. This is Chris once again on Chris White Africa, the Indaba Broadcasting Network. It is Wednesday, June 2nd, 2021. And my special feature live stream guest today, the second in the series, getting back into interviewing guests, is none other than the conscious caracal himself, Ernst von Seil. Ernst, hey, how's it? Hello, Chris. I'm uh, doing well. Like I told you before the show started, there's a, a direct positive relation between the amount uh, of uh, messing up that the ANC does and the amount of work that lands on my desk. So I'm very busy uh, at Afri Forum, and that's how I prefer it. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me on. I'm looking forward to our chat. It's been a while since we've had a conversation. Uh, so let's make some quality content. Absolutely. I agree. You know, it has been a while. Um, I think the last time we really chatted much in depth was probably around November. Um, the events at Brockenfell and, and I had you on after that. And that's when my channel was peaking. We got over 20,000 subscribers by the end of November. And then um, the minions at, um, at YouTube started playing games with my channel. And since then, it's been a struggle. And eventually, you know, the other the original channel is suspended. So now we're on the new channel here. And we'll see how long this lasts. In the meantime, uh, multiple other platforms out there for my content, letting people know about it. But um, yeah, um, as you said, uh, when the ANC messes up, uh, it's uh, it just it gives you lots of work to do. It's the same for me. When the ANC opens its mouth, I have golden opportunities to, to talk about what they're saying. And some of the things I'd like to get into today is I saw an op-ed that just came out um, just before I went live saying exactly what Chris Wyatt's been telling people for years and been telling everybody on YouTube for over a year now is that expropriation without compensation is not about land. That's a, that's a, that's a uh, red herring. It will be about land. They'll take some land under it, but it's about political cowing. It's to make your opponents be quiet or you'll take the resources and pilfering. And this op-ed says exactly what I've been saying forever is that don't make the mistake of thinking it's just about land. It's also about all your property, retirement accounts, bank accounts, your your, your bucky, your, your cars, your jewelry, whatever they want to take to make you shut up instead of opposing government. So I want to talk about expropriation today, if you, if you don't mind, and uh, probably a little bit about the firearms bill. Uh, you, apparently you can't have a firearm for self-defense. Well, that's an interesting concept. Uh, and then, mm. um, gosh, we could talk about uh, Tzuelim Kili, uh, you know, the, the health minister's corruption. Apparently now his son got a secondhand Bucky as part of the... I mean, this is mm. like the days of Tony Yangani. The corruption is just so inept. It's it's unbelievable. But um, mm. yeah, and um, and if you don't mind, um, uh, I, I'd like to chat briefly about um, Early B's music video, It's Time for a Change, mm -hmm. that's for the DA campaign. Whether you like the DA or mm. not, you got to love the song. Anyway... Um, hmm. So anything you want to start off with, just uh, point out something I might not have mentioned. Uh, I think those are all excellent topics, Chris. So I think you can take it away with whichever you want to lead in with. Okay, well, let's let's start with um, let's start with the DA. Okay, um, hmm. since uh, the, the DA is uh, I've, I've been criticizing all the opposition parties in South Africa, including the DA, not the civic civil rights groups, but the, the political parties and saying that they should have gotten into the act in June of last year when the, e the lockdown was first eased after people were prisoners in the home and they let you go out a bit. I said that was the time for political parties to get out in the grassroots level and mm -hmm. do their campaigning, not, not run a campaign for the municipal elections, but to make the people aware of the disaster that South Africa is becoming under the ANC. And mm. uh, some of the, 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 the kickback and pushback I got from political uh, parties was, well, you know, if we just campaign is, you know, pointing out all the evils the ANC did, it's not going to win. Well, maybe in the past that might have been a, a, it. Might have been the answer, especially during the state capture era when everything was state capture, state capture. People just tuned out. But when you tell people they can't have cooked chicken or buy open-toed shoes or shop on e-commerce sites because um, I don't know because the National Coronavirus Command Council said so, uh, it's fertile ground to recruit people to your standard. Whether you're the Freedom Front Plus, the Encada yeah. Freedom Party. UCDP or uh, Yanni Democratic Movement or the DA to get people to come to your standard by getting in townships, getting in rural areas, getting into the, the hostels where minors work, getting into the leafy suburbs, get out there and recruit people to your standard. But by and large, the political parties haven't done that that I've seen since June of last year. We've seen the DA just now kicking off their campaign with a very catchy bit of an earworm tune there from uh, early B, it's time for a change. We're tired of excuses. My people want solutions. I love it. What are your thoughts? 
Uh, so my main thought here is that, uh, well, firstly, the catastrophic lockdown uh, regulations from the ANC have definitely created a golden opportunity for opposition parties to gain ground. Um, I would have liked to see a, a little bit of more aggression from the DA in regards to highlighting specifically why you need to vote for them. Because I think if you look at the ANC, Chris, let's be frank, this is a party that is morally depraved and it's not my personal opinion. They've proved it. I think you can even scientifically prove it at this point. Um, really, when you look at the, the, the ANC party, this is a party that looted funds intended for the sick and poor during a pandemic. That's how low uh, they have gone and how shameless they've become. And I mean, I was talking to someone just today and I said every week uh, a new ANC carder uh, is exposed as being corrupt. Now, I was really in Kize being one of the most recent ones and he was the media golden boy. He was the, the future of the ANC. He was painted as this clean record, straight shooter guy that's going to uh, be a reformer and he was... Uh, He's not in the, so a lot of people, I think this is actually, I, I was talking about this on the Big Daddy Liberty show uh, last week, and that is this whole myth about uh, within the ANC, there's a good and a bad faction. Uh, well, uh, the the main consensus within the commentariat seems to be that there's the, the evil Ace Magashule faction, and then there's the, the valiant Sora Ramaphosa faction that's non-corrupt and clean. Well, Zuele Mkhize is part of the Sora Ramaphosa faction. Uh, he's not allied with uh, with Ace within the ANC. He is one of uh, Sorrel's main men at the forefront uh, of the battle. And uh, now he's also been exposed. And I mean, it's, it's really just so shameful in regards to... Uh, one of my favorite quotes from him was when uh, when all this came out, he said, well, I didn't personally uh, gain uh, anything from these uh, or from these uh, uh, activities. Uh, it, it was, but he failed to mention that it was his family and friends, but they, uh, maybe it, he, it just slipped his mind. Um, so, yeah, that's the my main takeaway in regards to the ANC. I mean, we can go into that uh, yeah, for for hours, but getting back to the opposition, I think. If they don't seize the opportunity now to gain support, uh, then there's not a lot of hope for them. And then they're going to have to be, unfortunately, replaced by a new batch of opposition parties because uh, this is the golden moment now. This is the, the moment where you can strike at the heart of the beast. Uh, I mean, South Africans from all across the political spectrum are feeling uh, the, the effects of the ANC's failed policies in their wallets, in their social lives, in their every facet of their life. And uh, I think this is this is the make or break moment. This is the moment where we're going to see what opposition parties are made of. And that's why I'm saying, uh, that's why I'm also going to be hypercritical of any opposition party because uh, they can't slip up now and we can't uh, play games now. And this is obviously not a game. People's uh, livelihoods are at risk. Uh, uh, political um, stability is at risk. Uh, this is a very, very dangerous time in regards to South Africa. And uh, if we don't have uh, op uh, opposition that are wake up and opposition that are really paying attention and focusing, they might fumble and drop the ball. Uh, and that would be disastrous. So we'll see. Uh, I think the, the DA has uh, unfortunately had to correct course now after a disastrous previous campaign. That's out of necessity. I mean, they can't do anything about it now. Best thing they can do now is to lick their wounds and to make sure they don't make the same mistakes again. Uh, I think uh, Helen Ziller's book that she uh, wrote was an excellent step in the right direction. Um, I also had a conversation with her on my channel a while back. Um, and I think that's uh, it, it. Reading that book shows that the DA was willing to own up to the fact that they'd made mistakes. And Helen Ziller personally uh, owns up into the, in that book to the mistakes that she made. And I think that's a very mature thing to see. It's a refreshing thing to see. Um, so they are good signs. Um, I can't say that uh, the, I'm overly optimistic in regards to the ANC's imminent demise. Um, but it's now or never, and we're going to have to see. But it's going to be a very interesting time in South African uh, politics, and uh, I can't wait to just observe and see what's going on. Well, I would agree, and I'd say that um, it is a make-or-break time for the opposition, um, individual parties and the opposition in general. Quite frankly, uh, after this, and, and it, I don't, it doesn't pay me to say it, it doesn't, doesn't thrill me either, but um, Bantu Holomisa's United Democratic Movement he rises or falls on his personality, and he's 65 now, so... If they don't do something this time, they're they're not going to have any seats in the parliament. I think they may just may just disappear altogether. Um, I had him on as a guest in January. He was a fa fascinating guest, and in that vein, the Encada Freedom Party has been beyond quiet. Um, almost nothing from them. 
this is their golden opportunity to seize uh, KZN's municipalities, get back in charge in Durban, and or get in charge of Durban, not back in charge, and get in charge of Peter Maritzburg. But I don't think they have the energy or the drive or even the interest, it seems, at this point. Uh, Mangasudo Butelezi has been incredibly quiet other than dealing with the spat in the Zulu royal family, um, trying to, you know, the secession crisis. Uh, as far as the DA, um, they got a lot of work to do. And the Encada Freedom Party, I interviewed Dr. Corne Mulder months ago, last summer here, f- winter for you guys. And um, I pointed out that, you know, now is the time. And we had a, a very productive conversation. But I've heard nothing from Freedom Front Plus. Um, and th- I think they're one of the parties that has a golden opportunity, particularly in the Northern Cape and the Western Cape, to maybe capture some of the m- small municipalities and prove that they can do something. I think at this stage, though, and this has been my assessment for a long time, whether you like the DA or you hate the DA, you have to make the decision, do you hate the DA more than you hate the ANC? Are you more disappointed in the DA than you are in the ANC? And we can make arguments about the DA's performance in Cape Town and the Western Cape um, and Nelson Mandela Bay. Those are all fair points. But honestly, I think the only hope that South Africa has politically, legitimately politically, short of a civil war, is for people to vote in mass for an opposition party to unseat the ANC in all the metros where the power rests. Now, that won't solve South Africa's problems because the national government still controls resources and the police and things like that that come down. But it would make a difference, as we saw in Nelson Mandela Bay, in the brief time that Awful Trollope was mayor, mayor there for the DA. Streets got fixed, potholes were fixed, rubbish was picked up. Uh, transportation was working, water was restored, and people started to see what could happen when you had legitimate governance. The problem is that so many South Africans have grown up without legitimate governance. They, they don't know what proper um, law and order and governance is. That it, If it bit them in the face, they'd be like, well, what's this? Oh, you mean my officials actually answer my questions? Oh, they, they take comments? You, you mean they didn't steal? We were expecting to steal 20% of the money. They didn't steal any? Well, that's amazing. Now we can actually open our schools. I think that um, the, the time has come for South Africans to get off their bum and stop their bitching and whining and moaning, complaining about the political situation and be part of the solution by going out on the 27th of October and casting a ballot for any opposition party. Mm. Uh, there is something else that I need to mention, Chris. You said there uh, uh, is the DA really much worse than the ANC. If you said, uh, can the DA really be that bad when you compare that to the ANC? There is, however, an important principle when it comes to opposition parties. I don't think you should ever vote for an opposition, or uh, you should never let an opposition, uh, you should never tell an opposition party that you'll vote for them no matter what. Uh, I don't think you should vote for an opposition party just out of virtue of being the opposition, because then uh, that opposition party is not going to be accountable. Then that opposition party is going to very easily just uh, abandon its principles for support. And that's unfortunately what we saw in the previous uh, chapter of the DA. I think they got complacent in the belief that their voters will vote for them no matter what. So I think that's a, something that people need to be cautious of in, in terms of never just vote for an opposition party because they're the opposition. I think you need to make sure that your whoever the opposition is, in specifically South Africa, you're only going to get one chance to uh, unseat the ANC. And whatever you replace them with, you better make sure that that's a party that's going to stick to its principles. Because you might just That's why the label of ANC light stuck so badly to the DA, because they were showing signs that they would uh, pander to the the mob and pander to uh, ANC voters with ANC-based or or ANC-like policies. Um, For example, um, uh, when uh, Adam Zeruz talked in Parliament in 2018, uh, did his uh, presentation on EWC and the DA MP told him that uh, he wasted his opportunity and that she can't agree with anything that he said there. That was a major red flag showing that uh, the DA was uh, getting complacent in regards to who their voter base is and uh, what, uh, why people actually vote for the DA. Mm-hmm. So I think while, yes, the, the ANC is absolutely horrific, I think still you need to keep perspective in regards to you need to make sure you, re- you replace them with a party that's, just, that's not going to just end up uh, turning into a, a bit more clean version of the ANC 10 years down the line. I think that would be just as much a failure because well, then absolutely. you spend it all this energy for nothing. But like you said, uh, crucial uh, crucial elections coming up later this year, and I'm uh, very curious to see what happens. Well, exactly. But to clarify, to be specific here, I mean, let's be honest and realistic here. Outside of the Democratic Alliance, no opposition party has a snowball's chance in hell of unseating the ANC from any metropolitan area. On their own. Only the DA has that opportunity. In, in, in Cape Town, in Nelson Mandela Bay, uh, in, in, in Joburg, in Schwana, those are all places where the DA had the plurality or the majority, Western Cape, in, in Cape Town, had the plurality last time, and they have the ability to pull it off again. 
these other parties don't have the ability to pull it off. So some folks like Ronaldo Jos, the ward counselor from um, Nelson Mandela Bay, talks about coalitions being the future in South Africa. That's nonsense. I disagree wholeheartedly with that. I've seen coalition governments. It's called Italy and 88 governments since World War II. They fall <laughs> apart all the time. We saw the perfect argument against the coalition in Nelson Mandela Bay where the DA was short one position, so they had to ally with, or two positions, ally with minor parties to get a majority. And those parties tried to extract, you know, um, you know, they tried, they tried to, you know, get, get things out of that and corruption and such. And you can't have that. So what my suggestion is that, that people vote for the party that has the opportunity. And that's why I said in Northern Cape, in some of these small towns, the Freedom Front Plus may have the advantage, you know, and if that's an opportunity or that's the party you believe in, then vote for them. Uh, but in the major municipalities, the only party that, in my view, and it has a real chance of unseating the ANC on its own and getting a 50% majority so they don't have to govern a coalition <clears throat> is a democratic alliance. And what I'm telling people is that is that you're just going to have to bite the bullet um, and, 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 and expect the best of them and hold their feet to the fire. Uh, now, some people disagree with that, but I mean, if, if people go to the polls and vote for 19 parties, then the ANC gets 51%. They remain in control of Chwana, they remain in control of Joburg. And Joburg is an interesting case because now Herman Mashaba, has decided that his action essay really is a political party after saying it wasn't a political party, it was just an organization, and he's going to run for the mayor of Joburg and bring back his divisive um, race-fueled politics to Johannesburg. That, I think, is throwing a monkey wrench into that situation and will likely split the vote at least three directions between ANC, DA, and Mashaba because he retains support because of his, his time as a successful businessman and his reputation. And I think that Joburg is going to be a bit of a mess and Joburg may, may be the one place that nobody will have a chance to rule directly. No one's going to get a majority. So anyway, I, so just, just to clarify there, I, I get your point and I don't vote Republican in the States just because I trust Republicans. I don't trust them at all. <laughs> Oftentimes, it's the least disastrous of the choices available to me. Uh, and I think mm. that's the case here. Some people don't believe in the DA and uh, some people don't believe in the Freedom Front Plus. Some people don't believe in the IFP. But I think at this stage, virtually nobody who is a cogent, rational, homo sapien mm. believes in the ANC. Uh, maybe just a final thought, a very quick thought yeah. there, Chris, yeah. on the uh, action essay. I really think uh, th they're going to be uh, one of the, the wild cards within this uh, within this uh, elections coming up and into the future. I think they've got momentum to uh, not just uh, be a cope that's going to fade away. And I base that on a very interesting policy approach that they've adopted. So Action SA is one of the few South African parties that very openly uh, make one of their core uh, points or one of their core stances a strong border. I think that's something that a lot of South Africans are hungry for. I think the DA has been woefully weak on the, the borders question, on the really securing South Africa's poorest borders. Um, I think uh, just from a strategic point of view, mm -hmm. um, a more nativist approach from Action SA as opposed to the pan-Africanist approach from the EFF, I think is going to uh, turn some heads. And that's just my prediction. I think it's going to contrast so strongly because the rest of the field are either pan-Africanists or just don't seem to really care that, all that much about the border. I think Action SA and Hamma Mashaba capitalizing on that void is going to be uh, their, their trump card, uh, to excuse the pun. Um, I think they might, uh, they might come something interesting out of it. I might be wrong, but we'll see. Uh, I'm going to be uh, keeping a very close eye on his party. As I was saying, I've got this gut feeling that uh, he's going to be a bit of a wild card this time around. Well, I don't disagree, uh, but it's hard to predict these things. And I would say that, um, you know, when, when he announced it wasn't going to be a political party, it was just an organization. I knew that was BS. This is this is headed to being a political party registered so he could run as a candidate. And they're going to contest uh, a few places. I expect him to do well. Um, and maybe even he could possibly even win in Johannesburg, defeating the DA and the ANC there. We'll see. I don't know about his prospects for the rest of the country. I get your point. Uh, and certainly um, controlling the borders is something that resonates with a lot of South Africans. Uh, xenophobia against foreigners remains quite high, particularly in traditionally black neighborhoods and townships and places like that. So I get that appeal. That makes sense. Uh, and he, I, he's definitely a wild card. And certainly in Halteng, he's going to be a major wild card. Whether that pans out across the country, we'll see. I mean, the IFP really has never grown its base beyond KZN. That's where the IFP is at. Um, and so the UDM is mostly in the Eastern Cape, although not exclusively. Uh, and I think that uh, that Mashaba's party may prove to be just a Haoteng um, sort of thing. We'll see. I think it's interesting the points you make there. But the bottom line is this, South Africans, get off your ass and go vote. 
I'm so sick of hearing South Africans sit here and offer advice about, not you, Aaron, but in the chat mm -hmm. and in my conversations mm -hmm. with people, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. You get off your ass and go vote. If you don't vote, you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Well, the votes, get out and vote. Stop whining, get out there and do it. Make it happen. You know, we had 17 million people in South Africa that didn't vote in the 2019 elections who were eligible. 17 million. That's insane. Well, the ANC will never lose. The ANC only got 10 and a half million votes in 2019. That's less than they got in 1994 in a country that was 40% smaller population-wise in 1994. Think about that for a moment. That's insane. The ANC is not popular, despite people think. And they've already fractioned and, and, and broken apart into COPE, which has kind of, kind of died and gone away for the most part, and then the EFF. And what will be the next split? Will it be Ramaphosa and Zuma factions? Is that what's coming now? So you can defeat the ANC. They've made it easy. It's so easy. Anyway, we could talk about that all day, Aaron. Let's uh, slide on over and talk a little bit about the, um, about the, you want to talk about the firearms uh, legislation? Um, yes, uh, okay. seeing as we've got a big, uh, big campaign at Afri Forum, uh, I'd love to. What's, uh, can you lay the, the foundation for us, please, Chris? Yeah, the South Africans, a bunch of nut jobs. want to take your guns and let you be killed by gangsters. <laughs> That's the case. No, no, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the ANC has introduced led, uh, a bill once again to constrain firearm ownership in South Africa. Famously, mm -hmm. about 20 years ago, they tried this, and initially it was all about registering firearms. Of course, a lot of families have had firearms, some of them antiques, going back a hundred, couple hundred years, and it's just been a tradition many um, South African families to have firearms, just the nature of it. You, you had to defend yourself for a long time, and it's just sort of what people had. Uh, but apparently not all firearms were required to be registered. The ANC wanted all of them to be registered. So they put this law in place. You have to register your firearms or you're a criminal. And then they failed to deliver the paperwork to police stations where people could register their firearms, thereby turning hundreds of thousands, if not a few million South Africans, into lawbreakers uninten unintentionally on the individual's part, but intentionally by the ANC in my view. Um, that was a disaster. They had to pull back from that. They tried to introduce the current bill a few years ago. It fell apart, didn't get the support in the parliament they thought, and now they're back. And included in this measure is a provision that says you must justify why you need a firearm. So if you're a sports gamesman, you know, you do trap shooting or something like that, you've got to explain that's why you need a firearm. But interestingly enough, the South African <laughs> government in this bill says that the right to self-defense is not yours. You can't have a firearm. It's not a justification to own a firearm for self-defense. Now, for the millions of women who are victims of gender-based violence or, and those who are murdered as a consequence of gang rapes and things like that, I'm sure that they'll probably find that to be very disheartening, not to mention those who live in rural areas who are constant victims of syndicates of organized crime who are murdering farmers and farm workers and farm managers at an alarming rate across South Africa for the past 25, 30 years. So that's kind of the, the groundwork. That's where we're at. It's one of six new bills that just went before the parliament. Uh, and this is a quite disheartening bill. Yeah, I find it absolutely insane that the government of South Africa doesn't recognize the human right, the right to life, to protect yourself. And I'll leave it for you, Aaron, to mm. take it from there. Mm. Uh, yeah, no, I think that sums it up perfectly, Chris. Uh, so, yes, this is, I think, one of the biggest fights of the year if you're a South African in regards to our core rights that uh, enable you to be free uh, and the, the rights protecting your freedoms, your freedoms that are dwindling every week under this, uh, this uh, tyrannical regime. Um, so yeah, Afri Forum is definitely also uh, has entered the fight. I had an excellent conversation on my channel with uh, Marnus Kamfer of uh, Afri Forum's uh, 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 community uh, organization department, uh, where he talked about how uh, we're going to. Uh, well, firstly, he pointed out the flaws of the legislation, how it's going to work, what implication it implications it has for firearm owners and then he uh, explained how you can help so one of the things that you can do to help is you can go to the website www.myfirearm.co.za um as the afrikaans is can you now www.myfirewapen.co.za uh, and then uh, on that website you can fill in your comment in regards to this legislation and uh, afri forum will send it uh, and it will also give afri forum a bigger mandate to fight this legislation legislation going forward. Um, we've already got thousands of people signing up and we also welcome uh, all the other civil society organizations that are joining us in the fight. Dear SA, uh, I see the IRR also uh, uh, joining the fight, uh, GOSA, and the list goes on and on. Uh, that's something that South Africa very, very luckily is blessed in a very large regard with, and that is a strong civil society. We are blessed with so many uh, strong and uh, influential civil society organizations with solid principles. 
Um, I think that makes us very lucky. And I think that's our saving grace to a very large extent. Besides the, the ANC's incompetence, uh, God forbid the ANC were actually competent with their, their horrible policies uh, and implement them perfectly, then we would be in a very different country in a bad way. So uh, those are two saving graces. The, the first one being our very strong and competent civil society and our very incompetent government. So yes, yeah, so maybe just to, to repeat, because this is very important, that website that I named there, uh, www.myfirearm.co.za. Go fill it in if you haven't in or haven't already. Uh, every uh, every contribution counts, and that's going to increase our mandate. But Chris, yeah, this is, I mean, as an American, you, this this type of legislation must really be hitting you in the wrong way. I mean, this must really be like a punch in the gut seeing South Africans have to deal with this. I mean, it's it's evil. It's not just uh, some. It's not just out of ignorance that the governments are doing this. And I think that's the biggest mistake you can make. I know the saying goes, don't attribute to malice what can be attributed to ignorance. But in this case, malice. don't attribute to ignorance what can be attributed to malice. And I think the government knows exactly, and Be Becky Chele knows exactly what he's doing here. And uh, that should make you very determined to fight this legislation wherever you find it. Um, and I think this is definitely one of the biggest fights of the year. And I'm so glad to see the massive, I mean, I've, I'm blown away by the amount of resistance that has already uh, stood up against this uh, draconian legislation. It's very heartening. Uh, it gives me a lot of hope for the future. And it shows that uh, there's a lot of South Africans with their heads screwed on right. Well, I would have to agree. Absolutely right. And, and, and I'll get to the point you made a moment ago about being an American, being, you know, um, disheartened by this sort of thing. Um, it's happening on this side of the Atlantic, too. Um, they they take um, these mass shootings and turn them into media events to to sway the, the ill-informed about America. You know, uh, nearly half a billion firearms in this country, and we're talking about a half a dozen or so incidents per year in a country of 330 million people. Uh, you're bound to have things like that happen, unfortunately, particularly when the media glorifies violence and Hollywood, you know, has, you know, a thousand murders per film or something like that. So I'm, I'm embellishing, obviously, for the for the, for the the woke tards watching the stream uh, and trying to find a point to use. Um, I'm embellishing. That's called embellishment. But anyway, the point is it's very disastrous. We've seen time and again what happens when firearms are taken, when the Soviets disarmed uh, Russians, uh, we saw what happened there. When the Nazis disarmed Germans, we saw what happened there. The Khmer Rouge disarmed Cambodians, the few that had firearms. New Zealand disarmed their citizens a few years ago. Australia has famously disarmed their citizens. And we see the behavior of the Australian police. I don't know if you saw the video in Melbourne, Australia this week, where people showed up to protest and the police came to them. It was very calm and rational. It was all under control. The police said, listen, you can't demonstrate here. You're not authorized. The permit's been pulled or you don't have a permit, something like that. But the bottom line is that the media showed the fracas in which there was a fight between police and, and private citizens. And they put that out as basically thugs in the streets assaulting the police, which is a total lie. We see the full video uh, videos and we see what happens is that these citizens, they say, okay, well, we appreciate it. We'll, we'll leave. And so they leave quietly, peacefully. They go back and they're walking back to the cars and a gaggle of about 60 police officers start shadowing them on the opposite side of the intersection on the other street and start rushing ahead and then charge across the street and run over and start beating on these citizens and then arrest them, accusing them of uh, uh, you know resisting arrest and attacking the police. They have no firearms. And so they work with impunity. That's where I'm headed towards. This is what states do to people. They take away their ability to defend themselves. The reason we have firearms in this country is yeah, not to hunt animals. It's not for trap shooting. It's not even for self-defense from the standpoint of an intruder in your home, although that's authorized. It is because we recognize at the outset of the formation of this country that an oppressive state is the greatest danger to citizens and their liberty and to the community. That is the greatest. And we saw that from King George and the English. And that's why we left. We said, we're not part of this band. You can take off and you can have the Beatles when they come around in 200 years because we don't want them. But uh, we didn't want to be part of that whole thing. So we left. So seeing an effort to disarm South Africans in a state where the gangsters have all the firearms they need. No one's controlling that. Mm -hmm. I mean, look look at the, the assassination of Nico Swart, um, the, uh, the executive from Richards Bay Minerals, who was a viewer of my right. own channel. Nico was a viewer of my channel. Um, I'm, I'm heartbroken and, 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 and crestfallen to hear about his assassination. With an AK, it looked like an AK-47. The round, the holes in, the, in this window are huge. I mean, now, he obviously probably didn't have a chance to defend himself because they, they ambushed him at intersection like they did to Brett Kebble and Sanders. But it shows what country you live in. Exactly, exactly. And so, so why in the world would anybody in their right mind try to disarm law-abiding citizens when they know that everyone's at risk? Can you imagine the people in the rural areas? No firearms? 
We already see brutal and horrific, uh, sadistic tortures and murders and rapes and dismemberments of people in rural areas. Can you imagine how out of control it's going to be if they were to take all firearms from people in the rural areas? It would just be just it'd be open season. Crazy. Mm. And uh, this also coming from uh, on the back of uh, the VIP protection budget being increased. I mean, that's just the peak of hypocrisy. Yeah, well, that's that isn't that always the case. We saw it here in the states with uh, with all these celebrities who don't want to disarm everyone else, but then they run around with a whole coterie of of armed uh, security guards to protect them and protect their property. But we can't have firearms to protect us against people who try to intrude in our fire on our property. Utter nonsense. Mm-hmm. You know, we've already dealt with this. Um, we have uh, Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, and it shall not be infringed upon by the government. But state governments have infringed upon that constitutional right, and in my view, haven't been challenged enough. For instance. Uh, we had a case a few years ago of a young man who was married and had a horrible marriage and it was breaking up and he went from, I think George, I can't remember exactly, but he went from the South to visit his mother in New Jersey or relocate there. He had a licensed firearm in the state that he lived in. He had a lockbox in the trunk and the, uh, the, uh, the, it was not loaded. It was secured properly. His mother concerned about him because she hadn't heard from him and his phone must battery must have been dead or something like that. So she hadn't heard from him. So she called the police for her health and welfare. You know, if you see my son's car, could you make sure he's okay? Because mm. I'm worried his wife is nut job. She might have killed him, you know. And so the New Jersey State Troopers pull him over when they see his license plate. So they come up and do health and welfare and he's fine. And then they ask the question, do you have any firearms? Which is a standard question they ask in New Jersey, even if they pull you over for a traffic stop for a traffic light. Do you have a firearm? He goes, yes, I have a firearm. It's, it's in the trunk. Well, can I see it? And he took it out and he handed it to the police officer and they put him in place in, in, in handcuffs. And he spent five years in jail as a convicted felon for having an unauthorized oh. firearm in the state of New Jersey. We had a woman who had been who had been raped in Philadelphia, uh, a black woman. And um, then she was raped again two weeks later. And her brother said, get a firearm. So she went. She took a firearms course. She became uh, proficient in the use of a firearm. She got a license. And she had a licensed firearm in her vehicle. There's this idiotic bridge in Philadelphia down to where the sporting complexes are where if you get in the wrong way, you get stuck. You're forced to go across the bridge. You can't retreat. So she made the wrong turn and had to go into New Jersey. She went over and took the immediate turn off, went underneath and came back on. As she came back up to go back on the bridge, state trooper pulled over, arrested her. They were going to put her in jail for five years as a convicted felon for having a firearm. A woman who was twice raped. Uh, and then had this firearm protect herself. And she was a licensed firearm owner in Pennsylvania. So so this sort of effort to disarm citizens goes on all the time, all over the world, even right here in the land of the semi-free. Mm. <laughs> well, uh, uh, yeah, Chris, well, I, I pray for your continued freedom into the future. Um, but yeah, uh, here in South Africa, it's a bit of a different story. At least you guys uh, still can rely to a very large extent on your institutions to keep your, your constitutional rights safe here in South Africa. That seems like a dwindling, uh, uh, a dwindling uh, thing to fall back on. But yeah, in regards to this bill, um, this is pretty much the, the ANC telling you, uh, you're not allowed to uh, defend yourself. You need to be completely dependent on the state and the state's uh, police, the, the, the South African police service that will, one of the sorry it's actually no, no, quite sorry, funny sorry, yes i mean i mean so we're talking about dependent on saps who in many rural areas like in pumalanga don't even have operational vehicles to drive out they have to take combis mm-hmm. or taxis or you have to go yeah. pick them up to do a follow report for when your home is invaded that, that's who we have to rely on yeah okay that yeah. sounds good yeah and then also there's something else uh, included in the bill and this is what marinus talks about uh, in my interview with him on my channel um Every time you have to renew your firearms license, you need to send in your firearms for ballistics tests. Now, that means you go hand in your firearms at the uh, police station. They take custody of it and they do their tests on it. Now, here's the thing. Do you really think you're going to get those firearms back within a month or within a few weeks? No, you're going to be without a firearm for months, maybe even a year. Uh, I mean, well, it could be years. <laughs> well, but it's, uh, even, it's even, sorry, Ernst, but it's even worse than that because then they'll rent your firearm out to a gangster who will use it in a crime, and then your firearm will have ballistics to show that it was used in a murder. Mm. Well, uh, here's the thing, Chris. Uh, I think you're aware uh, there has been uh, scandals in South Africa of stories or reports coming out of police officers renting the firearms in their custody out to criminals. Yes. Uh, so your your hunting rifle, whatever you're sending in, uh, your shotgun or your handgun, uh, could end up in the hands of a criminal. Uh, and uh, it was a police officer that handed it to him. 
So not only are you going to be without a firearm for months up to a year, uh, in all likelihood, um, you're also, and in a country like South Africa, one of the murder and rape uh, uh, capitals of the world, uh, secondly, your firearm could be used in a crime. You might not even get your firearm back. It could just disappear, and then SAP says, well, you can go file a complaint, uh, and we'll see what happens from there. So no, Chris, it's and that's why I almost started laughing when I remembered this uh, this facet of the bill because it is really laughable. But it's it, it, at the same time not a laughing matter, seeing as it is genuinely evil what is going on here in South Africa. You would think common sense would tell you that in a country like South Africa, one of the easiest things you should be able to get should be a legal firearm a uh, 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 firearm license. Now, granted, I don't think firearms should just be handed out to people uh, on the street. I think you should go through the, the procedures that are there. It should be an easy and fast process, and it should be a legitimate process. It shouldn't just be like the, the leftists often say uh, or wrongly frame in America that you can just go to a counter and they hand you uh, your gun and you can buy it like a cup of coffee. Um, there should be regulation. I do think there should be a, a legal path to getting your firearm license and your firearm uh, but at the same time, that process should be easy. It should be fast, uh, and it should be uh, it should be uh, legitimate, and it should not be a, a process that takes you years. I mean, one of my colleagues at work just got his firearms license now, and it took him more than a year. Uh, me and my girlfriend are going to be applying for our firearms license. I was writing the exam very soon, uh, so hopefully by 2025, Chris, I can say that I'm a legal firearm uh, a firearm owner. Wow. Folks, you're listening to Chris White Africa and the Indaba Broadcasting Network here on the 2nd of June, 2021. My special feature guest today is Aaron Stefan Seil, none other than the conscious character himself. We're talking about a host of issues occurring in South Africa as we speak, uh, some quite disheartening. Uh, along the firearms thing, they very quickly, um, Lars Salas had the following to say. He's talking about combis, taxi drivers riding around. They carry cash. They don't take credit cards <clears throat> and they make nice prime targets. Can you imagine if none of them are armed? how often they'll become the, the mini cash and transit heist victims of these gangsters. And, and it just, it's, the lawlessness is already in South Africa. And if you take away firearms from legitimate people who have them to defend themselves, then these criminals will act, they're already acting with impunity. They'll act with even more brazen impunity. I mean, listen, these assassinations we talk about, Nico Tswart, broad daylight, um, Brett Kevel years ago, broad daylight. Uh, we talk about, you know, people being uh, assassinated and murdered, farms being invaded. Now, most of those tend to occur at night, but um, but these shootings and the 60 murders per day that take, I mean, look, it's 60 murders per day. How many people are going to be murdered in South Africa this hour while we're talking? And they want to take firearms away from people who are competent and capable of using them appropriately? Unacceptable. Uh, and South African society needs to unite, black, white, brown, whatever you may be, whatever your religion, whatever your faith, whatever your first language, you need to get behind this, folks, and prevent the mm. government from becoming a weapon of tyranny by disarming you. Uh, Chris, can you do me a favor and uh, give me a wrench in the chat so that I can post that link just uh, one more time, uh, uh, just to make sure people go to the correct yeah, site? Right, I right, see, so, uh, right, you got to write uh, something in the chat. Yeah, I, I, write, I put a little cat emoji there. Uh, um, got it, and I'll leave so, it if you want it. But uh, but yeah. got it why I want to do that is I see uh, Erica posted a link there, but it's uh, not the correct one. Uh, you posted www.firearm.co.za, but that's not the the correct one. Is myfirearm.co.za? Yeah. It's, but it's I'll, up, and so you can go ahead and do it now. So I like the little thank you very much kitty cat there. Yeah. It doesn't really look like a caracal, but I guess it's close. <laughs> it's the closest <laughs> thing to a, to a caracal. Yeah, Chris. Um, maybe my final word on this. Uh, this will pretty much be. Uh, like I said, uh, one of the big fights for liberty in South Africa, because don't don't make a mistake. Uh, I think EWC does factor into this decision by the government. And also don't uh, don't make the mistake that this is just a uh, Becky Chele going rogue and uh, doing this uh, just out of his own re for his own reasons. Um, this legislation had to get the approval of the ANC. This uh, this legislation went through the, the process within the ANC. So all the carders know about it. Cyril knows about it. Um, and they're doing nothing about it. They approved it. So uh, this is just as much so Ramaphosa's uh, legislation or bill as it is Becky Chele's bill. So don't make a mistake about that. This is not some rogue MP. 
um, uh, just uh, trying to to mess with South African firearms owners in South Africa. This is uh, the ANC centralizing its power, and uh, I am absolutely certain that uh, EWC factors into this. I mean, uh, what what a better way to steal land from people than to know that those people, the, the rightful owners of that land, don't have a gun and un, are unarmed. And I mean, that's why we need to start talking about EWC, Chris. It's not um, land reform. It's not righting the wrongs of the past. It's theft. Uh, plain and simple. And that's what you need to call it. Uh, don't mince words and don't say a good thing about deeds that are despicable. Well, we'll get to that in just a second, but I've never minced words about EWC, and I've the one pointing it out uh, all along. So we'll get to that in a second. But I did want to wrap up with the firearms thing and saying that it is comical to hear the African National Congress want to pass legislation like this uh, about ballistics, you know, for your firearms, if you're allowed to have them, when they can't even maintain forensics. They have, you know, 18 months of forensics they can't process. Um, You have no hope of getting DNA um, looked at if you have a rape case or a murder. It's unbelievable how ineffective, well, it is believable. It's the ANC. It's the angry, naughty children, so it's quite believable. But a couple comments from people here just to show you how bad things are. So Barbara mm-hmm. Schilling all said her brother, unfortunately, committed suicide five years ago. The police took the gun. They've never gotten it back. So who was that sold to and how many murders has that been involved in since then? Uh, Charles Argo uh, said his firearm was stolen on a flight from Durban to Cape Town when he handed it in. Like you do on a flight, you can travel it, but you have to hand it to it. And he never got it again. Never saw his firearm again. What's that been used for? And when will they come looking for you because it was registered in your name and it's been used to commit a crime? Then you have to defend yourself and turn your life upside down. It's unbelievable. All right, so let's switch to expropriation without compensation. Now, I have told people every time this idiotic piece of legislation has come up is it's wholly unnecessary. First off, Section 25 of South Africa's Constitution from 1996 allows for the state to take your land and your property with compensation. So if there's a need to right historical wrongs, there's been a measure in place since 1996 that allows for that in an orderly fashion. In fact, the government's sitting on something like 100 plus thousand hectares of land that they've acquired that they've not handed out. Not to mention all of the uh, aspiring um, historically disadvantaged farmers who have received no extension services, virtually no credits or grants from the government, no training and education, vocational training to be farmers. Now, many of them who've survived and exceeded has succeeded, have gotten that from the good-hearted nature of existing commercial farmers, typically Afrikaans-speaking commercial farmers who have helped their neighbors who are new farmers, and and that's the reason many of them have succeeded and survived. But this expropriation without compensation is wholly unnecessary. It's all a smokescreen. It's all twofold. Number one, yet another way to steal from people and pilfer resources. And number two, this is a tool to cowl the political opposition. I've been saying it all along for years, and I've said it since my YouTube channel started covering these issues last year. Over a year now, I've been saying that the reason for this is so that every time, Ernst, you say something against the ANC, they'll simply say, you know what? Your checking account looks pretty pretty thick, you know? Um, I like that Bucky that you have there. Um, we're going to pick it up on Monday. What do you mean? Well, we're going to expropriate it for the be- greater cause. But you can't. It's not legal. Well, it is. The Constitution's been amended. We can take anything we want. It is not about land. That's where people are falling down. And when you talk about land, most people don't own land. Only a fraction of 1% of people in South Africa actually own any land whatsoever. Chris, I don't own land. Ah, exactly. <laughs> I don't own land. So, so a fraction of people, and I broke down the numbers in my article, which I put on LinkedIn a few years ago, talking about this nonsense. And I said, you know, uh, I talk about land and poverty in South Africa. It's all a red herring. It's all utter nonsense. It is all fictitious. First off, the ANC wants to put a million black South Africans onto farms. What kind of morons are they? The rest of the world is going to automation and robotics, reducing the people in farm labor and putting people into ro- into other things where there's a higher salary. But but this is about cowing opposition because they can take your uh-huh. retirement account, they can take your bucky, they can take your jewelry, they can take your home, they can take any property they want and legally get away with it. And this is morally reprehensible. It flies in the face of the Human Rights Declaration. It also is illegal under the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, and South Africa should be forthwith suspended from participation in duty-free access to U.S. markets because they violated by simply introducing this nonsense legislation, and that's my position. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts? No, absolutely, Chris. Uh, so maybe, uh, yeah, so I think your audience might be aware, seeing as we have a lot of cross-pollination between our two audiences, but... Um, I did a presentation uh, against uh, expropriation without compensation earlier this year in front of the South African Parliament. There's a clip of it on my YouTube channel. Um, and, and, and in that presentation, I actually threw some stats uh, the way that I think are very hard to refute. So if you don't mind, I'll uh, give you some of them. You're probably already knowledgeable on it, but more uh, for your audience's sake. Um, so there is a, a 
a land restitution process in South Africa. It does exist. If you can prove that uh, under the previous regime, your ancestors were dis uh, wrongfully dispossessed, uh, you can file a land claim. And if you, that land claim is legitimate, you back, can get back, your land back. Back to 1910. Yes, yes. So there has been uh, a lot of successful claims like this, but unfortunately the ANC's corruption has pretty much uh, soiled the entire process and made it unworkable. A lot of ANC carders getting farmland that they have no historical claim to. Um, so here are some of the stats, and, the, and, and the, here's the kicker, Chris. These aren't AfriForum stats. These are the government's stats. So yep. these are their own stats that I'm going to give you now, and it paints a very grim picture for their argument, for their argument of a... Uh, that uh, it's not their fault. Uh, the, the, the problem is that uh, white South Africans just don't want to give up their land. So the first statistic that uh, I will, I'll read to you is the 82% of all these land claims were lodged in urban areas, not in rural areas or exactly. for farmland. Exactly, like District 6. Second, yeah, absolutely. Second, uh, The second statistic, 93% of all plaintiffs preferred financial compensation over land. Yep. They didn't want the piece of land. They don't want to become farmers. They'd rather want financial compensation. 93%, Chris, that's almost, the, the, that 7% is almost insignificant. So small is it? 93%, I mean, I mean you're going to struggle to find a, a more damning statistical per, a, a percentage in regards to the direction that the wind is blowing than a more than 90% one. Mm -hmm. Here's another 90% one. 95% of all land reform projects in South Africa have failed and commercial farms are con and these commercial farms that have gone through this land reform process helmed by the ANC uh, are quickly converted into subsistence farms or squatter camps according to the the ANC not according to AfriForum not according to the IRR according to the ANC's own reports 95% of these projects fail Chris it's um, and here's the last one that I think really just puts the final nail in the coffin. Of all the land that the government, the ANC government, has acquired since the start of their land reform process, only six percent has been transferred to private ownership. So, don't buy. And I'm I'm preaching to the choir, but I want to make sure people understand. Don't buy that argument of oh, the willing buyer, willing seller process has failed because there's not a lot of willing sellers. There are a lot of willing sellers. Yeah, go look up Pam the, Golding and all the real estate yeah. agents in South, the estate agents in South Africa. You'll find hundreds of farms and farmland on sale mm. at this very moment, despite the yeah. fact that it's under threat of expropriation. It's still on sale. Yeah. Yeah. You know who's the, the, the problem is not that we don't have willing sellers. The problem is we don't have a willing distributor in the government. Mm -hmm. yep. They buy all this land and then they don't want to give it up. Then it's just too good a prospect to, uh, to give to ordinary South Africans or to get put that into private hands. So there's pretty much the, the entire picture for you. I mean, those statistics paint the, the picture that shows that EWC is not grounded in reality. It is absolutely a absolute scam and a farce. Well, it is. I mean, listen, um, in this past, in the budget, when they started talking about this stuff, they gave yet another bailout to South African Airways, a corrupt, bankrupt airline that's not even flying, billions of U.S. dollars, and they put aside $35 million to the lands ministry to acquire land. $35 million, and you're giving three, two, three billion dollars to a defunct airline? Where are your priorities? You don't have to change the law. You simply have to apply the laws that exist. And that's the problem. But that's what they do all the time, Ernst. And it's not ANC. It's leftist. People to the far left side of the political spectrum. It's all about power and controlling people. And they make the decisions in your life. And that's what's going on here. It's not about the land. This is just, this is, I mean, the land is a misnomer. Here, let me pull this up. So I'm going to, you won't be able to see this, but it's on the screen. I'm going to put it up for it's folks. Fine. I've showed this article before, and you may or may not have seen it. This is, I wrote this three years ago, April 7th of 2018, South Africa land in poverty. While I was still on active duty, it's an op-ed piece, and I talked about solutions, establish a national sovereign wealth fund, a genuine, not the fake one that Cyril claimed to establish, reform resource, redeploy the South African police service, reform public education, uh, eliminate corruption and corrupt practices in government, implement genuine land reform, not window dressing. And then I have this chart up, which the people can see now. It says the number of individual landowners per race in South Africa. There were only, out of 59 million people in South Africa in the 2017 land survey that the government conducted, 181,532 landowners, of which 95,000 were white, which is 53%. African were 40, 41,000, 22%. Colored were 22,000 or 12%. And Indians 
were 15,000 or 9 percent. And then people classified as other, which is 4 percent. So these lies about land just continue. And this is government data that's freely available. I mean, I downloaded this report in 2017 when it came out and read it and ingested it and analyzed it. And it's just too easy to blame people for skin pigmentation and, and, and blame others for your failures when the obvious answer here is that this is all about power and control and intimidating anyone who dares say anything against your government of the day. And let's make no mistake, if it wasn't the a ANC in power and this was the law of the land, expropriation without compensation, whatever the party of the day would be would abuse this law because it would be at their disposal. They would abuse it. If it's inconvenient, if someone's being a little bit uppity, saying things distracting away from what you're trying to accomplish as a government, you'll just go and take their property or threaten to take it and they'll be quiet. And that's the end of the conversation. This is a very chilling, chilling piece of legislation. And the fact that the ANC actually introduced it removed all credibility that they were the party of liberation, that they're a party of, of, of multiracial governance in South Africa. It's all a fraud. It's been a fraud since beginning the National Democratic Revolution. This communist takeover is what it's been about all along. Mm. No, absolutely, Chris. And uh, what we're seeing here is just, uh, as you said, there, it's the furthering of the National Democratic Revolution. And don't think for a second that uh, these ANC carders don't know what they're doing. I mean, from the very start, it's always been about centralizing more and more power in the hands of the state. It's never been. I can't think of a single instance where ANC legislation has handed power back to the people and not towards the state. Everything is a one-way street. And that's uh, actually a rule of thumb that I would recommend people use. If you are still, your mind is still boggled by ANC policy, you see a policy like the firearms bill, or you uh, you see the, a policy like EWC, or you, see, you hear about a policy like NHI, or a policy like BEE, just ask yourself, does this policy increase government power and control or decrease it? That's pretty much the rule of thumb. And you'll find in every single case when it comes to the ANC, it will fall into the former camp of this policy increases state power, centralization and control. Because that's what every uh, every bill before the ink is even dry uh, is is based on, that they want to centralize as much power in their hands so that they can abuse the funds of the state to enrich themselves. And they don't give a damn about the average South African, no matter how many beautiful speeches uh, Sir Ramaphosa gives, or how many rather, I should rather use the word majestic speeches uh, as uh, the editor of News24 uh, prefers. No matter how many majestic speeches Cyril does, his party have proven specifically over the last year with them looting funds intended for the sick during a pandemic, they've proven that they don't care about their voters. They don't care about the average South African. They don't even care about the people in their hometowns where they come from. They just care about their own self-enrichment. And it's clear as day to see, uh, not in the, the light of day of a new dawn, but rather uh, during, I think, one of our darkest hours. Um, that uh, this is just a party that is rotten into its very foundations. Well, and you see that in every aspect of South African life. We see that um, Grand Parade can't un unravel the Burger King assets, which they've been trying to get rid of, and now their stock is taking a big hit because they are selling it off, and it's being sold off by a majority black-owned company. They can't sell it to whites because that's a crime under BEE, apparently. And so yeah. the stock is cratering. It's likely, it's very possible that Burger King might go out of business in South Africa as a consequence of this because yeah. they just, they, they can't manage it and they want to get rid of it. <laughs> and they've stuck this BEE stuff in there to just really mess things up. It's it's really disgraceful. The, the, the blatant bigotry and racism that comes out in South Africa is just beyond the pale. Uh, it's just astonishing yeah. to see this happen in South Africa. I, I don't... I, I don't know what to say at some point. It just You say the same thing over and over again. Listen, I could start my stream every day talking about either murders in South Africa and run a whole hour talking about murders in South Africa, or I could talk about corruption in South Africa, the latest government minister or ministry that's involved in corruption. Last week it was Guede Montasha. This week it's Zwele Mkizi. Yeah, Zwele Mkizi. Zwele Mkizi. The list goes on on. Two weeks ago it was the freaking corrupt member who was the former Durban mayor and then was appointed to parliament, the provincial parliament in, in, in KZN and is suspended, but she was appointed so she could draw a salary and that's you know it's just ridiculous but let me go back to land no. real quick so these are some of the questions i raised in my article so and i'll put this back on the screen for people to see so that they can yeah, go for it. it okay so i said 
Addressing land for the benefit of all South Africans, vice race-based vengeance. I said the land debate in South Africa should raise several pertinent questions regardless, re, regarding redress of land grievances. Chief among them, who has lost land since 1910, which is what Ernst kind of talked about there. 1910 was important because South Africa never existed before. That was a collection of independent Boer states, African kingdoms, and the British colonial possessions. The Union of South Africa Act of 1910 created South Africa. So at the Convention for Democratic South Africa, CODESA, back in the early 1990s, a reasonable accommodation was reached. Land claims can go back to 1910. Anything before that, it lost to the sands of history, consequence of conflict, consequence of war, and settlement either by the Bantus or Europeans. Anyway, so the first question is, who lost land? That's a legitimate question. Who wants land? As Aaron said, not everybody wants land. Some people don't want land. They simply want to have a plot to build a house on. They don't want to have a 1,000 hectares of farmland. Who wants to farm sheeps in the northern Karoo? No. Not me. That's for damn And they sure. want to live uh, in the cities where they can get a job. Exactly. And, and they, there's entertainment. You can go to nightclubs and go to restaurants and see things and do things. And there's better around. schools, yeah. And so what, what do people want the land for? What's its intended purpose, which is what I just got out? And where would claimants like to own the land? Uh, just because there's a land available, much of it's in the northern Karoo, or not in the northern Karoo, in the northern Cape. I think a lot of people living in KZN don't want land restitution be, by being handed a piece of land next to a military reservation in the northern Cape. Uh, so you want where they want the land, that's important too. Uh, what plans are there for agricultural support, extension services, vocational technical skills training? Is there a partnership plan for fixing this issue together? Landowners, farmers, government, provincial, and national. And then I came up with a list of prudent steps to take, a complete and honest national public review debate on all land. And I won't go into it, but I put the link in the story if you guys want to check it out. That's um, a story that I did three years ago about this whole issue. And this is right after Um Cyril became the president. And he <laughs> pretended to be serious about corruption and about addressing land issues. And he has not addressed either of them other than to blame people of insufficient melanin for being responsible for his failures. Mm, absolutely, Chris. Um yeah, I think uh, you can only go so long just blaming everything on uh, Jacob Zuma before you start realizing that Cyril has done nothing to to change the course of the course of the ship. I mean, under Cyril Ramaphosa, at this point, you can almost you can well, not almost you can say that corruption has continued to flourish. Um, how many uh, people have been held accountable for state capture? How many people have been held accountable for COVID-related corruption? How many uh, ANC carders have been uh, held accountable for any of these many municip uh, municipality scandals uh, that we've seen in regards to corruption? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And all Cyril does is he gets on stage and he says that uh, things, don't worry, I'm not a president that just talks, I'm a president that uh, does action. Well, your administration does a lot of action, but that action is looting. So uh, unfortunately, I don't see a lot of uh, positive action coming from this side. And unfortunately as well we're fighting an uphill battle regards uh, regarding the pr of the anc mm -hmm. seeing as uh, they've got their own PR, private pr companies in the south african media uh, people that uh, pretty much lick their boots for a living um and uh, this is something that we've seen uh, from the start of the pandemic and uh, even going further than that. Uh, it's always trust Cyril, make, uh, let's get behind Cyril, let's, uh, the ANC can reform itself, there's just some rotten apples. No, well, the, the ANC proves every day that it's not that there's just a couple of rotten apples, uh, the entire barrel is rotten. And the, the, the fresh apples left in that barrel, I think it's only a matter of time before they succumb to the rot as well. I mean, when you are surrounded by crooks, uh, you all you also have to become a crook yourself and i mean this is one of the biggest fallacies for me when it comes to the anc apologists is when they say uh, cyril is surrounded by all these corrupt uh, mps uh, sabotaging him and making his mission so difficult he's the leader he's the guy that can chop heads he's the guy that can make heads roll he's the guy that can tell mps your time is done uh, you are out of here um, he is the guy that appointed many of these corrupt MPs, not just inherited them from the previous regime. And the ones that he inherited, he keeps around willingly. Um, so, yeah, no, there's um, the ANC. Uh, up until now, they've been very effective with their good cop, bad cop routine of uh, there's a there's a bad ANC faction and a good ANC faction. But at the end of the day, you just need to remember even if they do the good cop, bad cop routine, both of those cops work for the same corrupt police station. That's uh, that's the ANC in a nutshell. 
No, it absolutely is. It's disgusting. In fact, the only corruption case I can think of where anybody's been actually convicted of a crime is in the VBS scandal. And the only person convicted is a white South African who was complicit in it. <laughs> All the black South Africans were part of the VBS bank scandal. That's the Venda Bank. It's a, a scheme that involved uh, Shav Floyd Shavumbu from the Economic Freedom Fighters and others from that corrupt party. Uh, who defrauded uh, poor black South Africans. It was a bank that was set up for poor black South Africans, defrauded them of their life yeah. savings. And it's all gone. It's all been looted. No one's got any restitution that I'm aware of. And the only person that convicted so far has been a white banker who worked for the bank. None of the black uh, accused have ever been convicted. This is this is this is the typical elite behavior. They they cover for each other. They smoke and mirrors and obfuscation. Listen, you know, Sir Sir Ramaphosa is the Bill Clinton of the 21st century. You know, um, it's all about, uh, well, you know, it's, uh, well, uh, what, what, what's the news in the polls this week? Oh, gender-based violence. We are going to be serious about gender-based violence. We are going to arrest men and put them in prison just because someone says they committed a crime. That's how serious we are. Whatever the topic of the week is that the ANC is under fire for, he, that's what he'll suddenly talk about. But what action has he taken? Not a damn thing has been done about gender-based violence in South Africa because you have to fix it by first having fathers in the homes of children. So they have two parent families. So they learn right from wrong. They get discipline. They learn respect for human life, not disdain for human life. That's the first part. And that can't be fixed by government unless it stops its system that encourages single parent families. Now, it's uh, it, it, Sir Ramaphosa is just like Bill Clinton. Uh, whatever's in the in the polls, that's what we're going to talk about. And then we'll take no action to fix it. And his foreign policy is just abysmal. I mean, this idiotic nonsense. Well, it's it's apartheid vaccine. Uh, that's why the the rich white Western country. Never mind the fact that we're full of people of color in these countries. Twenty four percent of my country is people of color, so called. And plenty of Europeans are people of color. But anyway, uh, rich white people. Not to mention that the, the the Biden administration isn't uh, the the most white administration ever. No, no. But uh, but uh, we, we they're denying us vaccine the global south. Well, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, are you the same morons that um, that uh, put all your eggs in one basket? The so called pooling your resources under Kovac so you can all have one power to negotiate. <laughs> and what did Kovac do? While while Johnson and Johnson, Pfizer, Abbott, AstraZeneca, all by the way, any Chinese companies there? And any 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 Swiss companies there? Any South African by the way, Aspen Pharmaceutical is a South African company that's perfectly capable of making vaccinations and medications. Where are they? It's now been 7 months since the vaccines were developed and deployed. South Africa has supposedly received 44 million doses, yet they've only vaccinated half a million people. Why? Incompetence beyond the chart. And how do they distract from it? Well, they're racist. They denied us. Well, you have 44 million doses. What's going on? Why aren't you giving it to people? Your incompetence. And people fall for this all the time. It's absolutely nonsense. Now, 1.4 million on this. You talked about people who are in the pocket of, well, not just the ANC, but leftists around the world. South Africa used to have a very vibrant press that was very investigative. I mean, carte blanche did amazing investigations on television, which got people's attention for years. And then you also had the Mail and Guardian, which when it was found was a very investigative newspaper, did great reporting. You saw the same thing with the Daily Maverick, but almost all of them are captured now. News 24 has long ago been captured. Even the Afrikaans uh, publications like Rapport from News 24, all of them are captured. Show me, tell me one journalist that's done an investigative article into the composition the structure, the authority, and the actions of the National Coronavirus Command Council, which has now been subjugating South Africa to slavery for 15 months. Have you seen a single story in any media outlet about the National Coronavirus Command Council? I have yet to see a single one. Mm. Uh, well, Chris, just to add, uh, you were talking there about uh, the, the faux pas of the, the ANC in regards to the vaccines. But at the same time, these are the same clowns that just uh, just recently, I think it was 2019, they were outside of the, the U.S. embassy in South Africa singing one American, one bullet. Yeah. So uh, the, the, <laughs> the irony, it's almost it, it's going into the realm of satire at this point. Um, you also got uh, Sarah Ramaphosa coming out. Uh, two weeks ago saying um, we will not be dictated to by the world in regards to how we conduct our affairs. I think he's alluding to loans and to uh, vaccines and to whatever. And in terms of, well, those come with policy requirements. They come with policy, not just recommendations, with obligations. Uh, that's kind of how loans work. You don't think these the, the, these other countries and these other international organizations are just giving you the money out of the, the goodness of their heart. 
Um, but no, Cyril just wants the money, but he doesn't want the obligations coming with it. Um, but this same Cyril that said, don't dictate to us what to do, uh, we will go our own way, is the same Cyril that just then a few weeks later is crying big crocodile tears because uh, the West is uh, imperialist and doesn't want to give us more money and more vaccines for free and uh, just airdrop uh, assets and uh, pallets of cash into South Africa, if you will. <laughs> well, speaking about those two points, I mean, first off, you honestly expect me to lobby for your sorry bum there, Cyril Ramposa, when you allow people to threaten the lives of my co-workers at the embassy in Hatfield by one American, one bullet. You, you make that threat. You allow that kind of um, calls for public violence in front of our embassy where I've worked at. You expect us to fight to give you things. Fuck sec, you moron. And, and, and you know, this is utter, utter nonsense, this, 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 this stupidity that goes on here. They've, they've had more than enough opportunity to be part of this whole thing. As I said last year, I said, listen, um, if I had been in leadership in South Africa on the National Coronavirus Command Council, the unaccounted, uh, unaccountable, unelected, capricious, unconstitutional body, yes, I know there's legislation allows for it. It doesn't allow it to continue in perpetuity, which is what it's doing, and making decisions which violate the Constitution, doesn't have authority. But if I had been on that body, I would have been approaching Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, all of these companies from the outset, hey, listen, how can we help? We want to be part of the solution. <clears throat> We've got pharmaceutical businesses in South Africa. We can help them, you know, test. We can have test subjects to get volunteers in our country. We'd like to be part of it. Also, how much would you like for a down payment so we can be among the first to get some of the vaccine? They didn't do any of that. They relied on COVAX. That's, that's, just, that's just unacceptable. And there was another point. Oh, yeah, the other point. So, okay, Cyril, no strings. Last year, when Tito and Blaney got on the stage and said, when in early stages, February, March last year, when IMF and World Bank, people were screaming, oh, give us money, give us money. And then Tito Mbwini comes out and he says, we are not taking money from the IMF. We are not going to let them impinge on our sovereignty. And then a week later, he has to walk back with his tail between his legs as the finance minister because he was overruled because the ANC had stolen all the money. There was nothing left. And they had to take, uh, negotiate, get a loan. So $5.6 billion July and August of 2020. The African Development Bank, $285 million. The BRICS Bank, $1 billion. And the International Monetary Fund, $4.3 billion. $5.6 billion at the then exchange rate. That's 90 billion rand. Where's that money? Where, where's the transparency? The, they've received all that money. What do they do with it? Where has it gone? What schools is it built? What, what, what lunches is it provided? What roads is it fixed? What electricity is it delivered? Nothing. All gone. One can only surmise it's been stolen. I mean, they're not telling mm. us what they did with it. Government should be transparent, and the ANC is anything but transparent. So when Cyril says no conditions, you got no conditions. And what did South Africans mm. get? Bupkis. Mm. Chris, did you see uh, the <laughs> – I'm just going to get that story with the, the e-tolls where uh, the, the ANC spent 10 – no, wait. They spent, I think, I don't want to give you the wrong number, I think 10 billion rand to uh, to get people to pay or to, to track down people that uh, weren't paying their e-tolls. And uh, in the end, uh, let me just get that story here. Um, in the end, I think they're going to scrap the whole system now because people just aren't paying it. It's uh, <laughs> it's really showing that their, their, their fountain is running dry in regards to, to money. But, uh, oh, yeah, here's the story. So just uh, to make sure I get my uh, statistics right. So the story goes that uh, 5 billion, oh, no, not 10 billion, 5 billion rand, as if it's anything worse, uh, as if it's uh, a bit better. Um, the South African government, or the more specifically the South African uh, uh, National Roads Agency, Sunrol, has spent an estimated 5.3 billion rand on trying to recover e-tolls from motorists who are unwilling and unlikely to pay. Uh, and this is to recover uh, 10 billion rands worth of e-tolls that are outstanding, uh, according to this article by my broadband. So this just shows again, like the, the ANC tries to squeeze as much money from the, the South African population where they can, but this actually is very heartening to see that South Africans were just saying, well, to here, to and no further, and uh, you can come try and uh, try and get your money, come and get it. And uh, the ANC now wasted 5 billion rand to try and recover these funds. And it looks like it, it's not completely confirmed yet, but it looks like e-tolls are going to be scrapped real soon. Well, and what an incredible waste of money. And not to mention, every time I drive under those little purple lights, I feel like I'm being irradiated with something, you know, and I'll tank. I'm like, what's that? But uh, no, uh, let's. Uh, 
Yikes. Uh, I lost my train of thought there. I actually had a point I want to bring up there. It'll come back to me in a moment. But, uh, yeah, oh. it's uh, this, 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 the A and Oh, yeah, that's what it was. So, I mean, it gets even worse than that. I mean, okay, let's talk about the pandemic, all right? The Haltang Department of Basic Education spent 551 million rand, 551 million rand to clean the schools. Now, mind you, these are the schools that have been shut down for four months. Um, I know a little something about epidemiology and virology and about RNA and DNA. And DNA and RNA don't survive on surfaces for four months. So the schools should have been perfectly fine. Just a bit of dust, you know, mop the floors, clean up, wipe some things down, clean the windows off because no one's been in there. So after four months, they spent 500. And by the way, Solidarity built an entire polytechnical college for 230 million rand and it completed it on time ahead of schedule and under budget. And it is training white, black, and brown South Africans in technical skills that are highly necessary, like electrical engineering and, and you know, elect electrics, HVAC, plumbing, and things like that. So if a private... In their own language. In their own language. That's correct. Thank you for that. In their own, so if you, your first language is Venda, you're learning in Venda. If your first language is Afrikaans, you're learning Afrikaans and in Siswati, same sort of thing. That was done by a private organization in South Africa, but the ministry of or the, the, the ministry responsible in Tang for education spent half a billion rand to clean schools. Listen, Ernst, I would have done it for 10 million rand. I, I would have hired, you know, a bunch of Zimbabweans and we would have cleaned all the schools in two days for 10 million rand. And, and we could have saved four or 541 million rand. But then I guess there would be nothing for the uh, Chris. Maybe just uh, maybe just to clarify, the uh, Saltic uh, is only uh, Afrikaans uh, technical college, but we are uh, working with other communities so they can build similar colleges for their home uh, home language education as well. So if we are approached by someone that wants to build a Kosa uh, technical college, we will give them the blueprint. We will give them the exact way that we did it. Because the interesting thing there is. Uh, sorry to go a bit off track no, there. Uh, the interesting thing with Saltic, as you know, it was built with grassroots funding, no funding from a billionaire, no, no funding from the, the government. The biggest donation that was, well, the biggest donation given for the building of that uh, technical college was 10 Rand. Yeah. Yeah. No, my mistake. I actually read that, that the intent was to provide and deliver the training. That So when, when you said that, I thought that's what you were talking about. So if I misspoke, my mm -hmm. apologies. But I've read multiple reports of saying that the intent was to deliver instruction in people's first language. Uh, if that's through an mm -hmm. extension program, that was unclear. So um, just it's what I read in the press. They may have misreported mm -hmm. or I misunderstood it. But I didn't know you were involved in that. So is, is AFRIFORM part of that effort with, with, um, with Solidarity? Well, uh, Afri Forum is part of the Solidarity movement, uh, but we uh, this was specifically a project by uh, Solidarity's uh, Build Fund. So uh, this was a fund set up by the by Solidarity, the labor union, but Solidarity is our sister organization. So uh, we helped uh, in regards to uh, giving support and uh, not specifically funds, but also uh, helping fund uh, helping get the word out just uh, when it was they were fundraising for it. And uh, we also contributed in regards to the, the opening ceremony. And uh, yeah, so it's a it's a massive success story. And Chris, I can tell you the amount of positive uh, feedback we've gotten from people from all types of communities, all types of backgrounds is immense in regards to I think one a few of my colleagues work for Solidarity as well. And they say they that week when Saltec opened and it hit the news, uh, they just were getting emails from all across the country. Of people said, well, we want to take the first steps to, to emulating this. We want to start building our own institutions as well, because the state run institutions are crumbling into the ground and crumbling into dust. So and that's our that is our solution for South Africa in regards to the 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 solidarity movement model is to enable communities to start taking as much responsibility as possible for themselves rather than being dependent on government. And we work with any type of community that approaches us in regards to asking for advice, asking for guidance, asking for consultation in regards to how we approach it. It's pretty much an open source to put it that way. Uh, we've got all the blue the metaphorical blueprints and we will gladly hand it to anyone that's uh, that's willing to commit to it well i, I think that um you know if, if we're talking about when it comes to governance and and what people are doing and what the nc has achieved and not achieved uh, we have to give them some credit they had some successes early uh increased the tax rolls got people to actually pay taxes um who weren't paying tax in the past 
Uh, they had uh, a few decent macroeconomic policies early on, which made an impact. Not enough of an impact. The economy didn't grow fast enough, but it was, it was growing. And there were some good steps early on, but they've, they've clearly lost the plot. I mean, when children die in pit latrines by suffocating on feces two decades after the ANC takes power, I think that says all you need to know about how much the ANC cares about South Africans, and in particular, about black South Africans. If you care so much about black South Africans, why would you leave black children in schools where they don't have flush toilets or no electricity or no textbooks? I think that's all that anyone needs to campaign on against the ANC. Just show them what the schools look like. Show them what public transport looks like. Talk about the open-toed shoe band, the no-cooked chicken. Mm. It's just, mm. you know, it's, mm. it's, it's got to be easy stuff. But uh, Yeah, and, uh, and that's the unfortunate thing, Chris, is that uh, unfortunately Afri Forum and Solidarity can't help everyone. We don't have the funds. We don't have the means. But as uh, Kali Krill always uh, tongue-in-cheek remarks, he says, if the government were to give us a slice of the tax money, we could do a whole lot of good for a lot of more people. Um, so that's if true. we if we just had the funds and that's the only thing limiting us from from helping even more people than we already do is the fact that we are limited by the amount and we aren't funded by billionaires we aren't funded by governments we aren't funded by corporations we're funded by our members our members that give 20 rand 50 rand 100 rand donations every month um and uh, what and that makes it very democratic as well in regards to if uh, Afri Forum just pockets all that money or we start looting like ANC Carters, um, those members will be gone within a few days and we will be left with absolutely zero. That's the beauty of the, the model that we're using. Um, but yeah, um, if any of your listeners aren't already uh, a member of Afri Forum, I highly uh, I recommend that you, you sign up. We're at uh, 280,000 members now, making us the, the largest civil rights organization in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, yeah, every little bit counts. Uh, you you make it possible for everything we do. So I'm very, uh, very appreciative of all the people that have already uh, become members. Uh, if you haven't, uh, it's a very quick process and you can just go to our website to, uh, to, to do that. I should get Kali Kuro on my channel. Um, we've chatted in the past. Yeah. I should get him on and talk about a few things. But two topics before we, we wrap up I want to get to. Um, uh, based on your comments, I'm pretty sure that you've read this already. So let's just get your your, your, your wave cap, um, wave top level analysis of Helen Zilla's book, uh, Stay Woke, Go Broke. And then uh, we'll talk briefly, although you're not a big rugby fan, about the British and Irish Lions tour, mostly because of the impact yeah. of the guy. Oh, there you go. There you go. Well, yours is in better condition than mine. Mine already looks kind of dog-eared. But I'm, I'm about, I tell people that the important things in books I tend to highlight. So uh, if you look at it, let me do it this way because you can't see it. But uh, so look at that. Mm. There's a lot yeah. of text highlighted well, in this Chris, book. Chris, you're not alone. Uh, I don't highlight, but I use a pencil. Uh, my books also aren't pristine on the inside. Uh, you'll see all my books are very heavily uh, filled with notes and uh, mm. underlining. So uh, wave top uh, thoughts on uh, Helen's book. Hmm. Well, uh, firstly, I enjoyed reading it. Uh, it it's, a, it's an easy read. I think that's its strength, is that it's yeah. very accessible for the, the average it's, person it's reading it. It's not an academic not a, book. Yeah. It's not a book that's going to tell you, well, here's the, the entire history of uh, how we got here, and here's all this academic jargon, and I want to impress you because I'm very smart. No, it, 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 it's written in a way that makes it very accessible for, for people that don't even have a lot of interest in politics, but want to have a better understanding of what, about what's going on around them. Um, that's the, the big, I think it's big strength is the fact that anyone can pick it up and start reading it and it will be very interesting to them. It's not going to be dry and boring. It's a very nice read for the, for anyone that uh, is interested in the topic. Another thing that I think that I should give Helen a lot of, uh, props for is once you've read the book, um, you'll see that at, on many occasions, she owns up to the mistakes that she's made. She's not making excuses for the mistakes that she and the DA has made, but specifically the mistakes that she's made. She uh, takes a lot of weight onto her own shoulders and admits to all of it. Uh, she admits to the mistakes that she's made and she's very open about it. And that's something that I very much admire about uh, Helen Zeller is the fact that she was able to know. And I mean, if this was some ANC politician's book, it would just be a, a self a self-indulgent book about full of excuses on why uh, white people pretty much uh, made sure that he couldn't uh, fulfill his mandate. Um, but no, with, with Helen Ziller, it's, there, uh, there's not one excuse within that book. It's pretty much taking ownership of the mistakes that were made and painting a very clear picture about the road, uh, the road forward. So I would recommend it to anyone that hasn't read it. Uh, you can buy it at any bookstore. I mean, exclusive books. When I was lost in exclusive books, I saw it was the number one bestseller there. So you can go get it there. If there's one close to you, if there's not, you can go find it on uh, Take A Lot as well. 
Um, it's a good read. Oh, yeah, take a, lot a lot sale, of take a lot of sale ends today, by the way. Big sale. Their 10th anniversary ends June 2nd. So if you have, if you got till midnight, I imagine to go get it from Take A Lot. <laughs> Maybe a discount. Mm, mm, mm. Well, the two things, Aaron, that struck me about the book that jumped out at me that um, uh, I was one, I was completely unaware of um, because I wasn't in South Africa, didn't know the machinations going on within the D.A. Uh, the other was um, I was unaware that Roman and um, uh, Tile, Big Daddy Liberty, were the ones who drew attention to Ashley Schultz and what happened to her, that disgraceful behavior where she was mistreated. That's a beautiful story. That is an incredible story. I, I, I knew about the story, I knew, but I, I didn't know Roman at the time and I didn't know Big Daddy Liberty. And I didn't know that Big Daddy Liberty had got, I, I heard a story about a gentleman going there and, and making a point who was black to do that, but I didn't know it was Big Daddy Liberty. So my respect for both those guys was always up here. It's just, it's even higher now, uh, as if, if it could be higher. Um, but the other story that got me was that when uh, Musi Maimani and uh, Athel Trollope decided to resign, they called a press conference when the DA had a, an executive meeting. And Helen Zilla is sitting there talking, discussing, and, and they're being all coy, only to find out that during the break they'd scheduled a press conference to say they were leaving the party. That is – now, I've always had very high respect for – Well, Africa. Chris, that's, uh, that's Africa. That's African politics uh, yeah, no, in the God. So that. our politics work here. <laughs> I got that. But I've always had very high respect for Athel Trollope. I've always promoted him as a good guy, but, but um, I, I need to know more. But right now, my, my, my view of Athel Trollope is, is a bit tarnished at the moment. I was very disappointed in that. Of course, my view of Musi Maimani has long been tarnished. I mean, he's a political opportunist. He's not a real, uh, a real contributor to improving things in South Africa. It was all about him, his ego, and what he could do. And when he failed, he didn't even do the honorable thing. Just like that bozo Jeremy Corbyn in, in for the yeah. Labor Party in the UK, failing to resign after leading Labor to the worst defeat in its history. Um, and he refused to resign as a leader. Um, yeah. Musi Maimani should have walked up the next day and said, we failed. We lost voters. We've had I was the result. leader. We had worse results than last time when we should have surged ahead and gotten over 30% of the vote. I'm tendering my resignation. But he's a coward, and he didn't do that. Well, uh, I think the, the day that changed his life forever was when, uh, I can't remember who it was, but the South African press started labeling the, him the South African Obama. I think that pretty much went to his head, and he started yeah. thinking like, uh, I'm gonna be this uh, this world beater. But yeah, anyway, Chris, there's a there's a very nice thing that I also uh, failed to mention yeah. is when I read the book, I saw uh, Helen also had very nice words to say about solidarity and Afri Forum and about she, she dedicated I think four pages to us in regards to our solutions and our vision for the future, and uh, that was very nice to hear and uh, very nice to read rather. And uh, yeah, I, I sent a message afterwards when I wrote, uh, uh, finished reading the book, just thanking her for the, the kind words uh, in an environment where we still get uh, so maliciously smeared from all angles. It's, it's nice to have someone of her stature um, giving us such kind words. No, awesome. Uh, very quickly, before I get to the last question I want to get to you for here is that in the chat, people are talking about why is Macron uh, visiting Ramaphosa? Because Macron is sticking his nose in the Anglophone world uh, with his clueless foreign policy, denigrating the West, apologizing for something that France didn't do in Rwanda, now in South Africa, trying to throw shade on the United States the uh, United Kingdom and other countries while making France look like the, the you know, the, the middle of the road when they're actually they're complicit in many of the things that they accuse others of. So that's what's going on there. There's a lot more to it. I'll talk about that on uh, Night Owls tonight because I'll lead Night Owls with the news stream because we had this interview, so I didn't do the news. Uh, but then uh, Charles Argo says that uh, Cyril's asking Macron for nuclear power stations. It might be. Uh, I don't know. France has the world's highest percentage of nuclear power for electricity. But the thing is, if they do that, they'll have to convince all the Afrikaans-speaking South African engineers to return from France who are running those plants to work in South Africa. But with so, uh, I don't know if that's possible. Uh, Chris, we can't even build a coal power station at the moment. That's true. Or maintain them and keep an operation with 13.6 thousand megawatts of generation power out of South Africa's 52,000 yeah. megawatts of power is offline right now because of... of, of maintenance they can't they can't maintain yeah. it. it's a joke no it's a uh, well uh, it's a recipe for disaster i think uh, well i'm a big proponent of nuclear energy i think it's the future i think if, if you are serious about clean energy nuclear is your way to go but at the same time i can't see how if the anc can't even build a coal power station are they going to build a and maintain and run uh, a nuclear power station besides for uh, um Kuberg, uh, in the western cape which is uh, the other day I learned the, the only nuclear power station on the African continent. I didn't That's know correct. That. That's correct. Uh, my concern with Kuberg is that it's, it's getting old and um, the ANC doesn't maintain things. I worry about a nuclear disaster there sometime in the next decade or so. 
uh, because of the level of competence of their engineers. Well, it, it wouldn't be a surprise if uh, the Cape achieves uh, independence and uh, we get a very strange incident there as a little bit of sabotage, but that's just me writing some fiction. Speaking of Cape independence, we won't go into that, but it's probably time for me to get Hein Marks, Des Palm, and uh, Phil Craig back on the program. I had them on last year and see what the status is of that. But I want to ask this last thing before we wrap up here, Ernst, um, and that is the British and Irish Lions Tour. This is an iconic event. Um, the top stars from the four nations, uh, well, the, the, the Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and, but it includes all Ireland now, so even though that's not part of the United Kingdom. So the British Isles, they, they tour. They go to South Africa, they go to Australia, they go to New Zealand. They come every dozen years to South Africa. They're scheduled this year. Um, and now, apparently, there'll be no spectators, according to the National Coronavirus Command Council. Venues that seat 50,000 people, it isn't safe to let people sit 30, 50, 100 feet apart. So nobody will be allowed to come to this. At least that's the current position. This is going to cost South Africa billions of rand in revenue from tourists coming into the country and from South Africans yeah. spending money at this iconic event um that's one problem the second problem and this you probably don't need to go into this because i don't think you're a big rugby fan but the springboks haven't played a game since the rugby world cup final that they won in japan and yokohama in 2019. Uh, i have real concerns about their readiness and i think that you know georgia might have a chance of actually knocking off the springboks in one of their two test matches and if they do that's going to lead to a very dismal showing against the british and irish Lions. Anyway, so what are your thoughts about um, the uh, the government is still unprepared for this event 18 months after this pandemic started? It's insane. Mm. Yeah, Chris, well, maybe just uh, beforehand, something that went hand in hand with this pandemic, but also the this whole Black Lives Matter uh, nonsense with, with infiltrating sports and seeing I mean, I'm, I, I do like watching sports. I'm a big uh, football fan specifically, um, but I also uh, watch Not my a real sport. Of rugby. <laughs> <laughs> I've also watched my fair bit of rugby. But Chris, to be honest, uh, with uh, all these sports just capitulating to, to Black Lives Matter and to this political nonsense, it's just putting me so off that I don't get as excited as I used to for big sporting events because it's just going to be a bunch of preaching to me uh, and telling me how bad I am and how hateful and evil I am. And uh, it's going to be a bunch of uh, athletes that are being, uh, many of them being forced to do it because if they dare not uh, uh, kneel, th there will be some real consequences for them. And let's, let's not beat around the bush. It's not going to be a little bit of a slap on the wrist uh, if they are singled out uh, in this regard. So, yeah, um, I think it's a massive loss for South Africa that there won't be spectators at these matches. I think it's, a, it's one of those few opportunities where we get a nice, big injection into the tourism industry from uh, our foreign capital but uh, this is going to all just uh, be for naught so again big l for the anc big l for south africa and um yeah it's a uh, there's nothing really good to say about it it's a it's a tragedy i agree 100 percent um and but i do have a british and irish lions jersey which i bought almost a year ago when it came out and i do have the um the spring box jersey for the 2021 series We'll see what happens. Um, it's unfortunate. Yeah, it's it's really depressing. But you're right about these athletes, uh, some of them being boxed in a corner. Others lead the charge like LeBron James and is licking the boots of the Chinese communist. And then, you know, $890,000 salary guaranteed for starting rookies in the NBA, or not even starting, but contracted rookies. So almost a million dollars of income, and the per capita income in this country is $67,000. And they want to talk to us about privilege and, and, and wealth and things like that. When the lowest guy's making $900,000 a year, that's comical. But, uh, yeah, it is, it's, uh, it's really unfortunate um, what's, what's going on with sports. But what I want to say is that we had a football player, American football, um, the National Football League, play for the Pittsburgh Steelers, a combat veteran of the U.S. Army. And uh, when this idiocy started with taking Neil, which I consider to be black supremacy, it's not about black lives. They've proven that they're frauds, the people behind it. Um, they're all rich and have made a ton of money and it's all disappeared, kind of like the ANC. Anyway, but um, so the, um, this, this, this combat veteran um, who was playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers, instead of taking knee when it all started, stood with his hand over his heart to show respect for his comrades in arms who died, black, white, brown, and all. Who cares what they are? They're comrades in arms. He was pillared by um, other people in the league and other athletes and tried to push into, you know, taking a knee. Um, that's his personal, why, why, why can he not show respect for his brothers and sisters in arms and other people who want to take a knee? That's anyway, so it's, uh, you're right. Uh -huh. Athletes come under a lot of pressure, but some of them are just, they just pile on because they're idiots. They're not particularly well-educated and they really don't understand what's going on in the world. 
Anyway, yeah. so um, there. That's a fascinating conversation. Uh, Aaron, so I want to thank you for that. Uh, we talk all day, so we're going to have to end it here. Otherwise, we'll go forever. But thanks a lot. Um, you've invited me onto your channel. And so mm. uh, hopefully we can schedule that sometime soon. I look forward to coming on your channel. Yeah, mm. yeah no, absolutely, Chris. Uh, that was uh, that was always the, the idea in regards to uh, I wanted to, to come back on because I, I think the last time we spoke – was on my channel it was post election i think we did a post election a uh, little bit of analysis there on my channel if i remember correctly but my memory could be failing me it could have been just a few days before the election um but yeah uh, you're you're definitely welcome on my channel very soon i just got to get some admin there uh, in in line and then we can talk a bit about your country and a bit less about uh, the the failings of my own government but yeah chris thank you very much for uh inviting me on and really i'm going to make sure as many people as possible know that this is your new uh, youtube home this new channel uh, i'm going to be uh, making sure i'm going to be shilling for this channel on the social media making sure that they find you because uh, i still get messages from people asking what happened to chris and i always have to refer them back but i'll do a uh, i do a few posts again tomorrow um but yeah thank you very much always a pleasure speaking to you always nice to hear your your how passionate you are about my country you're one of the i think few americans that really that i've met that really understand uh, politics here and know uh, that have as vast a knowledge as you do but i mean with your background that's no surprise um so yeah uh, always enjoy your chats and if anyone uh, i'm pretty sure your audience is well acquainted with my work and with my channel but if they're not uh, you can find me on conscious caracal on twitter or on youtube um come say hi i also do uh, weekly streams over there yeah, I'll also make sure that I update the uh, under the stream your, your links, which uh, I normally have in there, but I was rushed because I traveled to Atlanta this weekend and uh, came back, so I didn't get that in. But that'll be in for folks. Yeah, and, and then when we talk, we can talk not just about the U.S., but also about the rest of Africa. There's tons of stuff happening in Africa right now, which is also my bailiwick. So happy to do that. So, again, thanks for coming on. It's a pleasure. Oh, by the way, um, I was uh, party to a recent Zoom session, which included Helen Zilla. And um, she committed to coming on my channel. So um, awesome. Just, just That's reach, excellent reach news, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very glad for you. That's awesome. So I'm looking forward to uh, to having her on. She was she was she jumped right in because I, it was before the stream started. And I was talking to this and I said, yeah, I said, um, I'm fascinated to be here because uh, Helen's going to be in this session. And um, I tried to get her on my channel, but uh, somehow the message didn't get her. And the people said she wasn't doing interviews. <laughs> then I saw she did an interview on a channel with like a thousand subscribers and my feelings were hurt. Uh, but I suspected that Helen wasn't even aware. Do you have was. any idea who I am? <laughs> I, I suspected that uh, that she didn't even know, and and she had popped in, and she was here in the conversation. She said, "Chris, let me tell you right now, take this as an acceptance of an open invitation to appear on your channel. I look forward to it. So um, I will have Helen on my channel sometime soon, hopefully. So there you go. All right. Also, just reminding everyone, please uh, leave a like. Let's get Chris to a uh, hundred likes for this stream. I think he would appreciate it quite a bit. Yeah, and if anybody here is uh, coming over from Ernst uh, program that hasn't been a subscriber on the new channel or never heard of me before, I, you must have been living in a cave um, if you never heard of me before. <laughs> but but if you haven't, feel free to subscribe. We don't mind getting subscribers either. It, it helps overcome the trolls. We had eight trolls show up the other day in a stream when I was in uniform for Memorial Day, and then people were all excited. Hey, he said, "Don't worry about it. at least your your subscriber count's going." I said, "Just wait for it." Two hours later, all those subscriptions disappeared. They just wanted to put their little rude, distasteful names up on the screen while I was in uniform. But that's okay. I can delete that out of my stream. <laughs> all right, Chris, I hope you have an excellent evening. Good luck with your – or best of luck with your uh, night. I'll stream later and your news roundup. I'll keep you posted on when uh, we are going to have a chat on my uh, YouTube channel. I'm very – uh, excited about uh, an African news roundup. Uh, you just gave me the idea. I think that would be actually be a very nice, unique uh, approach to our conversation. So I'll set that up and keep you posted. Um, and yeah, uh, thanks to the audience as well. Uh, you've uh, really been been great in regards to your participation in the live chat. And uh, I'll see you next time. Moi le. All right. Kealabo. Uh, bye bye, donkey. All right. Thanks a lot. Ernst von Sao, I'll let you drop off and then I'll close. Uh, thanks a lot, Ernst. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was Ernst von Sal, the Conscious Caracal. What a pleasure it was to have him back on the channel. Um, he was one of my early guests last year when the, my old channel really picked up steam. And actually, he holds the record as a guest for the most people that showed up in a live stream interview. 485. He just beat out Steve Hofmeyer. 
Steve Hofmeyer was, or no, I'm sorry, it was 4, 493 or something like that. So Ernst von Sal had the largest live audience uh, for an interview on my program ever. Not the largest live audience. I did live streams, which I had 6,000 people show up during uh, Seneca and Brockenfeld. But uh, for a guest, that was the biggest one I ever had. Uh, and so uh, awesome. And a pretty good audience here. We had over 10% of the subscriber base showing up here. So thank you all so much for that. Be sure to smash the like button. I'll be back for Night Owls and do a rundown of news across Africa. So thank you for your patience on that, folks. And uh, we, as I mentioned, Helen Zilla, Giselle, Big Daddy Liberty, all upcoming guests here on Chris White Africa as we get back in the swing of doing interviews. Thank you. God bless. And I'm going to get close here. We'll be back in a little over two hours for Night Owls. And thank you for your support, ladies and gentlemen. God bless. And my many thanks to my guest, Ernst von Sal. Always a pleasure to have Ernst on the program. The Conscious Caracal has his head screwed on straight. And it's always a pleasure to talk to him. Cheers, folks.